We're coming to you live from the studios of the Hagman and Hagman Report here in Northwest Pennsylvania. I'm Doug Hagman at the helm with fellow investigator, researcher, and most importantly, my son, Joe Hagman. Together, we are the Hagman and Hagman Report. I like to call us America's premier father-son investigative reporting team. Of course, we broadcast live every Monday from 8 to 11 p.m., every Monday through Friday, 8 to 11 p.m. Eastern Time. Our home base on the Internet is Hagman and Hagman.com. And, of course, from there you can access us live as well as uh, our social networking sites and our original investigative reporting. And tonight, we've got a great show for you lined up tonight. As uh, uh, as always, uh, a, a real crowd pleaser, Dave Hodges, uh, the, the, just a tenacious uh, investigative uh, journalist, and, and he's going to be on with us. Joe, welcome to the studio. Great to be here. We have uh, Dave with us now. His website is The Common Sense Show, uh, as well as his radio show on Sunday nights, um, at eight eight o'clock is the new time and eight o'clock that's right it will be here streaming live on Sunday night simulcast correct simulcast, yep. yeah yep um, at the Hagman and Hagman Report so Dave it's great to have you back on the show hey it's great to be here guys I, I got to tell you I got a bad 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 feeling in my bones in fact I was talking to Steve Quayle yesterday morning and we were talking about you know doing some things you know in December. And he said, if we make it that far. And yeah. I was I was thinking the same exact thing. When Steve, we mentioned the month, I'm thinking, man, I wonder if we're going to make it to December. Because every time I turn around, I find more and more evidence for FEMA camps. It's it, Guys, it's uncanny, uh, the evidence that's pouring out for this. You, you guys have no doubt been to my website and, You've seen the malls. We have malls, and for the listening audience that may not have been to the CommonSenseShow.com for a while, I have published pictures sent to me by eyewitnesses on the ground of malls, and some of these malls are closed. These strip malls are closed, and yet someone's coming in and building guard towers on them. It makes no sense why you would do this with a closed mall. And then there's newer construction, and I wanted to mention this in terms of Marana, Arizona. Marana, Arizona is on I-10, and it's uh, I-10 connects Phoenix to Tucson, and the two cities are about 120 miles apart, and Marana is a bedroom community, oh, probably 15 minutes north of Tucson. It's a community of about 34,000 people, and they're building a mall off with the, the Twin Peaks Road exit off of I-10, and there is nothing there. Nothing, no thing. I mean, it's guys. You, you, I've got aerial photos I published. There's not housing development, no apartments, no other retail. Just this mall in the middle of nowhere. And Marana is only thirty-four thousand people, and uh, I'm told that the nearest housing development's probably a good eight nine miles away. Who's going to drive there? No one's going to drive there. And this mall. This mall has no less than five guard towers. I mean, you look at it, it's, it's, it's guard tower stuff. You don't need an imagination. It's not like looking at the clouds and you see Snoopy. This is, these are real bona fide guard towers. And there are five of them around this mall that no one's going to be coming to. There's no anchor for the store, and this is what I get from the locals. And, guys, here's the big catch. It's right next to the interstate, and it's right next to railroad tracks. And I think we both know, or all of us know, what that means. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Now, you've got some, uh, well, actually, from your uh, article today, it is today, I just want to make sure, um, under the title, Every NFL Stadium is a FEMA Camp in Hiding, you've got the images. Um and folks, you can go to Hagman and Hagman dot com on the right hand side. We're linked directly to Dave Hodges' website, the Common Sense Show dot com. But you've got images of the uh, Marana Mall, middle of nowhere, next to railroad tracks, with these structures. I, I, yeah, I mean they're they're guard towers, I guess. I mean a guard tower. Uh, it- Back a couple of days, I've got aerial photos, ground photos. I probably have 50 photos of those malls. I had a gentleman uh, named Harold who sent me a bunch of photos that I couldn't upload to the website. So I put out an article, a request, 
hey, guys, could you check out on the uh, mall down there at Twin Peaks Road, I-10, north of Marana? And the next day I had 50 photos, and those have continued to grow. And I, fortunately, because of great listeners and great readers that I have that are willing to get off their backside and go do something, sent me all these wonderful photos. Uh, and, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, FEMA camp and waiting. And just the way it's constructed, it's constructed like a prison compound. But see, it's not just Marana. I don't, I don't want to have people think this is an isolated case. I've got uh, a photo I published, um, I don't know, 10 days ago, of a uh, strip mall in England, near Birmingham, England, that's closed. And the person showed me before and after photos, and they put guard towers on them, on a strip mall that's closed. Same thing up in Washington State. I've got the same exact thing, and I've got these photos people are sending me from all. I can't keep up with my email. I've probably in the last six, seven days have probably had somewhere around 5,000 emails, and, and, and I'd say probably 80% of them are people sending me pictures of structures that could be FEMA camps in the way they're designed, and a lot of it is the malls around the country. I mean, from Tampa to Charlotte to Atlanta to Denver it's incredible, guys, what I'm getting here, and there's too much of a pattern for this not to be real, that we're now seeing a change in architecture to where guard towers are becoming the norm. Now, I've had people try to write to me. I suspect they're COINTEL Pro, but they write to me, and they go, oh, this is just architectural design. You're making something out of nothing. Well, I would almost believe that, except, guys, they're doing this on malls that are closed. That doesn't make any sense at all. And it's not just the, the malls that they're doing this with. It's the schools. And, Doug, when I pointed you to my article on Sunday, yeah. you had a real noticeable reaction when you saw some of those schools that I published, like Regis Jesuit High School in southwest metropolitan Denver. I mean, is there any question when you look at that, that that's a guard tower and, and, and prison fencing, and then that uh, high school – in um, Brooklyn, New York, I think it was called South Slope, and uh, the barbed wire, the heavy fencing, the metal doors, and the the the, the cameras, incredible. Yeah, yeah. Really the, incredible. the Park Park Slope School in Brooklyn, New York. Um, that's right. So oh, that's it. Yeah. And and um, man, oh man, oh man, it, it's all over the country, and uh, you go around the Phoenix metropolitan area here too. And I've been hypersensitive to this now since these uh, things have arisen with regard to FEMA camps. And these schools are being constructed like prisons. And in some places, uh, I had a lady send me some pictures from a, uh, elementary schools in Atlanta that have guard towers in the center of the school. It, it's just it's mind-boggling. So we see, okay, the malls are set up for FEMA camp conversion. Um, and I should mention this too, Doug. This is a real important point. Back in 2012, I published an article in which I noted that DHS and Simon Properties had reached an agreement that Simon Properties would allow its facilities to be used for emergency centers. And they even used the word detention in the description, detention centers. And Simon Properties is the biggest owner of malls and strip malls in North America. And what's interesting is on most of these photos that people sent me, because they read the articles, and so they know I'm looking at Simon Properties, they will go get a property deed, and they'll go, this is a Simon Property Mall. The one in Marana is ultimately owned by Simon Properties through a subsidiary. So it's, to me, that's, there's your DHS FEMA camp connection, but that's not all. At the same time frame in 2012, the DHS signed an agreement with every major league sports league to do the same thing. And today, I, you saw I ran that article. Um, you know, every NFL stadium is a FEMA camp in hiding, and it's not just the NFL. It's the uh, NHL now in their arenas, the NBA in their sports arenas, Major League Baseball in their stadiums. But I published photos in there. And I showed how their practices for admissions are just like the TSA. Their, their practices before they let fans come in, uh, they're separating like in Kansas City Arrowhead Stadium where the Kansas City Chiefs football team plays, they're separating men and women. 
just like they do in a FEMA camp. And yeah. someone wrote to me after they saw that sign in today's article and said, that's UN signage, Dave, for detention camps. And he was breaking it down for me, and I'm going to study it more you know, after the show tonight. Yeah, I didn't even catch that part of it, but this gentleman was explaining this, and I've got to go do some research because I think there's a fair chance he's right. But they're doing the metal screenings, the wanting. My wife about, no, oh, no, 10 days ago said, what do you want to do on the 4th, honey? And I said, I don't know. We were supposed to do the fireworks thing and have some hot dogs and hamburgers. And she goes, why don't we go down to the Diamondbacks game? And I wasn't thinking. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's fine. I love baseball and fireworks and be a good family night. So I took the family down there, and we come up to the stadium where the Diamondbacks play, and they had about a dozen security lines out to the street. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, why am I here? And you could see the TSA door frames you got to walk through for metal screening. And, I, oh, here we are. And I'm thinking, why am I doing this? And finally, we get up to the line. Now, I'm just wearing gym shorts and a, and a T-shirt. And they have the, the, the same thing they have at the TSA. You take out your wallet, and you take out your keys and, and your cell phone and all that stuff, and you put it in. Now, I had nothing on me, nothing, just my body and my clothes. Well, I didn't know I set off the detector, so I walked through thinking I'm, I'm pulling my stuff out of this little can. And the guy goes, step over there to secondary. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Secondary. What, what's that? Over there, right now. And this guy was r unbelievably harsh. I said, uh, can you please explain to me what I did? He goes, you set off the alarm. Weren't you paying attention? And he was, he was just berating me. And, and finally I looked at him and said, how many terrorists you caught today? <laughs> and he looks at me and I said, how many terrorists you catch today? He goes, just get over there before I throw you out. So then this guy comes up to me, and I says, well, we're going to have an understanding here. You're not putting your hands on me. So he gets the wand out, and he starts wanting me. And I said, uh, how does it feel to I said, do you know how many people TSA has ever caught uh, with this kind of equipment at the airports? He goes, no. I said, zero. None. How many have you caught today? <laughs> he just looks at me. He says, have a nice day, sir. In other words, what I told him is you guys are so full of crap out here, you're subjecting these people to violation, massive violation of Fourth Amendment rights. Uh, you're, you're terrorizing these people. You're making them late to get into the game. You're inconveniencing them. It's 110 degrees out uh, here in Phoenix, Arizona in July, and it's just unbelievable, Doug, what people put up with. And I will never go back. I don't fly, uh, and I've written to the, all the airlines, and I've said this is why Dave Hodge just doesn't fly. You know, I remember, Dave, when you were uh, two, three years ago, when you talked, you and Alex Jones were talking about this very issue about you know, TSA coming to stadiums, and people scoffed and said, nah. You know, yeah, that's exactly. I, I said this was coming. Yeah. Um, it's coming to trains. It's already in trains and a lot of train stations, but buses, buses, and, and now I'm understanding. Now, people are going to say, oh, Dave, you're over the top on this, but listen to me, folks. Interstate Highway Security Roadblocks. And I've got the inside information from uh, my local state patrol here in Arizona. I know people who talk to me. And on I-17 between Flagstaff and Phoenix, on the side of the road, they have the strips laid out. So if you go down the wrong way, they flatten your tires and the video equipment. Oh, and man. I-17 running through the edge of the Rocky Mountains. Um, and they're going to be doing stops. And uh, it, they're going to be doing the get out. We think you're a terrorist. We, we need to strip search you. We need to feel up your mother. Because this is what, you know, you've seen the stories with TSA. Sure. Now, I will sure. say this. At the baseball game, they, they didn't try to put their hands on me, nor would I let them. Um, I'd go to jail for it, let someone, you know, do to me what they do at the airport that I won't permit to have happen. Uh, but we have power. You know, you look at Walmart, and they practice slave labor overseas. Uh, they're complicit here in Jade Helm, and we can get into that a little bit tonight, too. Absolutely. And I don't know, Doug, where this is going, because I have well, real, I have real bad feeling about this fall. I really do. I, I feel really, and I know you guys feel the same way I do, I feel a very special burden. I mean, it's a burden of love, but it's also a, a, a kind of an onerous burden I need to be accurate. I need to be on top of my reporting because right now 
I think people are going to are, are making life decisions based on some of the things that we broadcast and what we write, and that is a tremendous responsibility. And really, when I think about it, the gravity of it scares me. I have no problem taking responsibility for the decisions I make for myself and my family. But when we're talking about people that follow us and the numbers that are following right now, it scares me because I'm afraid of saying the wrong thing. I'm afraid of giving people the wrong message, and it doesn't work out. That's, that's really of everything I do, guys. That is my biggest fear right now would be to say anything that would bring harm to someone because they listen to Dave Hodges. You know, Dave, that's our biggest concern as well. We, we're we on our knees. We hit our knees, and we ask for guidance because we don't know. It's a heck of a responsibility. And when you put up, for example, you put up these images, these photographs, um, uh, to me they're clear cut. I mean, for example, right now on my on, on monitor one here, I'm looking at the the uh, stadium entry line. Families on one side, female on the other side. Now, expl- seriously, have somebody explain that the logical reasoning behind that that sign and and have it be clear and, and um, believable. The reason I say this is because. Uh, uh, you know, people will accuse you of, uh, they accuse us and Steve Quill of fear mongering, of, of saying, oh, this is, you know, of just overstating our case, being hyperbolic in, in our presentation. Well, I look at just that one picture, and this is just one example of many. And, and I ask anyone in the, in the mainstream media to really justify a sign like that or a, um, outside of conditioning, uh, justify the uh, purpose of, of something like that for stadium entry. I, I know I kind of went sideways on that topic, uh, uh, Dave. For You're right. Game. I know. You didn't go sideways. I, I feel the same way that you do. This is why you may have noticed a trend in my writing over the last three or four months. There's nothing like a picture to really convey the message. And when you look at uh, these people who are in line to go to an NFL football game, and, and if you go to the commonsenseshow.com in today's article, you can see this, where on one column of pictures I'll have what TSA does, extremely invasive, Fourth Amendment violations, uh, really it's sexual assault, second-degree sexual assault. They should be doing five years for each instance. And then on the right-hand column is a very similar picture, the exact same kind of poses and intrusions, uh, and only it's NFL game. So you have TSA on one hand at the airport, and NFL on the other, and there are your pictures. And what I find that people get, uh, I could write, hey, there are guard towers, and and KDW from Aurora, Colorado, wrote to me and said, I saw guard towers on such and such a mall in a school. There's nothing like a picture. That's right. It's every week on Sunday, I run the same article and say, be a part of the Common Sense Show team and send us your pictures, your storylines, your descriptions, and your videos. And my gosh, have people ever responded in force? And and to those who are listening who do that, thank you. Thank you very much. I find that, that a lot of people are really in a very serious state of denial about the lateness of the hour and about the events that are taking place around them. And it's it's kind of an evil genius in a way uh, by the powers that are doing this that, for example, you can... Uh, you can attempt to justify an image like the stadium entry line image that you've got up there, or you can attempt to justify or explain away certain uh, security measures at, at the games, uh, college games. But but it, it really doesn't. It, it's just pablum for the uninformed mind, in my view. This other lady, they interviewed her, and, and she didn't seem to like it, but here's what she said. I'm going to quote. It's kind of a nuisance, but I do understand the rule. It's a whole new world, and you've got to follow the rules and regulations to be safe. (laughs) You know, that woman must have been absent that day that they covered Benjamin Franklin's famous quote that said, any society that gives up a little liberty to gain a little security will deserve neither and lose both. And she must have been gone that day in class. Uh, These people who do this security of games, catch nobody. I mean nobody. It's just DHS saying it 
and the sheep go ba ba, and they go ahead and do it. But it's just all part of the conditioning. It's police state America. You know, we have kids in some schools now walking through metal detectors to go into schools. You know, I had a picture of a kid, uh, I believe it was yesterday, in my es- yesterday's article. Uh, he, was, he couldn't have been more than a first grader, and uh, the security policeman at the school was putting on uh, one of these magnetic wands over him. You know, to go to school, a six-year-old to go to school, like a six-year-old terrorist. And this is insanity. Well, we have the refugee resettlement program and uh, 9,000 Syrians, and I don't think we're exactly popular with Syrians now, given the fact that we made the civil war go the direction that it's going, and we brought 9,000 Syrians into Idaho. And this kind of refugee resettlement is going on all over. In fact, I remember reading a companion piece to that story, and the FBI was quoted as saying, we don't have time to vet all these people coming into the country. Yet, you know, they'll grope us, they'll fill us up at the airports, They'll subject us to unconstitutional searches at the stadiums, but they won't vet people who are coming in from areas known to be hostile to the United States. What's wrong with that? As I've said before on your show, I look at what's coming in three parts, and I've been very consistent in saying this for three years now. Um, We're looking at false flag or false flags, you know, precipitating incident or incidences. We're looking for the excuse from that to roll out martial law. From that, you get things like gun confiscation, you know, total evisceration of civil liberties. <clears throat> so people are at your beck and call for the government, and on interspersed with that, at the t- at trail en- tail end of martial law, I believe World War III will begin. And see, this is Basil's bright idea. The bankers, you know, <clears throat> the big bankers, the ones that control and tell the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England what to do, they want a depopulation war. Yes. And that's what World War III is going to be. And uh, no, no one in a civilized country who had a choice would ever participate in the kind of wars that are coming. So you've got to strip people of their rights. You've got to put a lot of them in detention camps and exterminate them. And people say, oh, Dave, that's crazy. Oh, really? Let's go back. <clears throat> Excuse me, to someone that you and I both knew pretty well. I mean, you guys knew Larry Grathwall pretty well, and I interviewed Larry absolutely times on my show, and I had a number of phone conversations with him, and I found him to be the most forthright, honest individual I ever met. Now, most people will have heard of Larry, but in case you haven't, he was hired as an FBI special informant, and his job was to penetrate the Weatherman Underground run by Bill Ayers and his wife today, Bernadine Dorn. And his actions and her actions resulted in the deaths of both American law enforcement and also American citizens. Bernadine Dorn did time in prison. Bill Ayers was able to skate. This wasn't a hippie group, as they've been portrayed. They were master's degree people from Ivy League schools, Bill Ayers' father, Tom Ayers, was the head of Con Ed of Illinois. Here's where this is going. You said, really, there won't be extermination in in FEMA camps in America in the modern age? Let's just consider a couple things. Larry Grathwell reports this, and I got the video up in yesterday's article on the CommonSenseShow.com, and Larry Grathwell talked about how he interviewed Bill Ayers. He said, well, Bill, if you ever win and you you get this communist takeover that you want, what will you do first? And he says, well, probably we're going to have to round up. And this is when America has 180 million Americans. You're going to have to round up 50 million Americans and yep. put them in re-education camps in the Southwest, and we'll have to kill half of them. Well, those numbers today translate to not 25 million dead, but probably closer to 40 million executed. You know, and Steve and I were actually talking about that yesterday morning, and he said, he said, I think it'll be 50%, Dave. He says it's going to be closer to 100, and I agree with him. Um, now, this is where this gets significant. Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn, and many of you already know this, launched the political career of one Barack Hussein Obama from their south side Chicago home. Bill Ayers still visits the White House today. I documented that in yesterday's article. Oh, when Dave, Dave that's, a, that's not the same Bill Ayers. There's a lot of people named Bill Ayers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's people putting on false Ayers, too, but this is the real Bill Ayers. And Bill Ayers is, is a friend of this president. 
He's unashamed. I ran, I ran an interview that, that uh, elders did with uh, Sean Hannity after Bill Ayers was on, and he was unrepentant about the terrorist activities he was involved in, the bombs that he set off. One of them resulted in the death of a San Francisco policeman. Yep. Uh, he could care less. And this is a guy who launched Obama's career. And, and we're not supposed to be worried. And the fact that he still has contact with Obama, and this man is unrepentant for his actions, is, these weren't youthful indiscretions. He's proud of what he did. That's why I put the elders' interview up there with Sean Hannity, to show that this man hasn't changed. So here's the mindset that was present when he, he and his wife launched the career of Barack Hussein Obama. We should be really worried about what's coming. I don't know if I ever said this, uh, Dave. Uh, I want to tell you this before I before this escaped my memory here. Joe might remember this. Um, I'm not sure how much we did off air. I know we did a lot off air. We, uh, Larry Grathwall and I uh, and Joe. I mean, we, we had a lot of many off air conversations. Now, about a month, maybe two months before he passed away. Well, reportedly, ostensibly from a heart attack, they found him in a they found him in his apartment. Uh, he, okay, after not hearing from him for uh, a period of time, I'm just not going to get into the details. But there are some really odd things about that. But we were talking, and I think some of this did make make it to the on air interview that we did with him. I think maybe two or three months prior to his passing, uh, we were going to pick him up or go with him and confront Bill Ayers. Um, uh, with with cameras and microphones, and we were going to act as his kind of you know uh, I don't know I don't want to say bodyguards but uh, you know accompanied uh, we were going to accompany him, and he in fact we we were planning on on doing this when uh, Ayers was going to be speaking at a university I think it was outside of Chicago perhaps I know he lives there but uh, uh, he had a speaking engagement and we were talking about doing this about confronting him and getting him to admit on camera or con- at least confronting him with uh with the uh, you know because Bill Ayers never and Larry Grathwell they I mean Larry Grathwell never confronted Bill Ayers publicly um or Bill Ayers would never allow Larry Grathwell to con- confront him publicly and, and, and ask questions so we were going to make that happen I just wanted to, and then you know 2 months later he's not with us any longer now I'm not it's just I'm just stating a fact, okay. Well, you know, Larry's daughter, who I believe lived, lives in California, uh, does not believe that was an accidental death. It, you know, it, it's it's difficult because you're dealing with family members who have families of their own, and there's a fear factor there, and there's a concern there, and there's you're dealing with some people who are pretty nasty people. I want to bridge the gap here after the top of the hour with um, talking about Obama's legislative actions that make us look at his association with Bill Ayers and Bill Ayers' intent to want to kill. In 1968, he wanted to kill 25 million Americans to get America the way he wanted. I want to bridge that gap with Obama's actions in office as the chief executive when we come back. Dave, before we go to the break, have you ever heard of a a death camp that borders um, Arizona to Mexico? I have a, a listener who at, wants me to ask you about a death camp on the border of Arizona and Mexico. They say that this camp is huge. It has uh, deep water trenches dug around it, and um, apparently yeah, my, it's near it, you. I don't have direct knowledge of that, no, but I, I will tell you this. As I pointed out, with shopping malls and strip malls and stadiums and schools, you can make a FEMA camp about out of anything. You know, yeah. converted uh, POW camps that held Japanese-American citizens, keyword American citizens of Japanese descent, uh, th- those have, have reportedly been converted to FEMA camps. Abandoned military bases have been. Uh, you know, Alex Jones, when he did his uh, piece with uh, Jesse Ventura on conspiracy theory, you know, they found a number of uh, FEMA camps that look like playgrounds from the outside. So when you, when you guys look at this, I don't have specific knowledge of what he's talking about, but I will tell you what's down on the Arizona-Texas uh, border are ISIS base camps. In fact, Judicial Watch produced documentation two months ago that shows there is knowledge of this government and the Mexican government of an ISIS base camp in conjunction with the Mexican drug cartels 
eight miles from El Paso, Texas, three miles from the Mexican border. Uh, that that is well documented, and I've referenced that several times in print. You, you have, and you've done a fabulous job. And I'll try and get the information uh, pulled up here about the specific thing and send it to you if I can. But we'll yeah. go. Well, to you know, our, our day and go down and look at it. I mean, you know, it's yeah. probably about a four and a half, five hour drive for me. But you know, if I get something credible with some pictures and something that makes it look like it's worth my trip, I'll go down there and I'll, I'll photograph, I'll videotape. And I'll uh, I'll interview people, but I've got to have some basis to to make me want to go. Uh, and let's get right back into it. Uh, go ahead, Dave. You were going to talk about Obama's legislative actions and um, in connection with his connection to Bill Ayers. Well, yeah, so much so much uh, to cover in so little time. But I think I just want to, for the purpose of brevity, just stick to two major points here. One is everyone will know, and I'll spend very little time on this, and that's the NDAA. And the NDAA, as everybody knows, allows the president or his designees to kidnap people off the street and deny them all due process. Uh, No one needs to know where they're at or even if they're alive. They don't get legal representation. They don't have to have their day in court. And, of course, if you're ever tried uh, under the NDAA and, and related enemy combatant uh, designations. Uh, they can use hearsay evidence against you. You're not entitled to an attorney. I could go on and on. It's a real kangaroo court. Well, that is designed to be the Gestapo. Let's go pull them off the streets and put them away in a deep, dark place so they can't wake people up. That's the NDAA. And that, you know, <clears throat> I remember Chris Hedges came out and said hey, the end of America when that passed. And I totally agree with Chris. He's 100% right. This is when we became a fascist Gestapo. East German Stasi loving nation. Uh, That's what we're under right now, those kind of regulations. But there's something particularly disturbing, and I've mentioned this executive order before on your show in a very general way. And Tonight I'm going to be specific, and it's a little involved, so be patient with me. (coughs) Excuse me, but I'm talking about executive order 13603. And I'm going to talk about two provisions this, this is a very, 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 very involved executive order. It's the control of everything in the country. I mean everything, from the clothes on your back to all food production to all water, everything. But I want to focus on two specific and very narrow things in this bill that should scare the living heck out of everybody. 13603, and you can find this on my website. I'm actually going to write about it again tomorrow and give it a modern twist into Jane Helm. And you've got Section 601, and this act specifies how far the government can go in terms of making you their slave. And I am not exaggerating with the terminology and vocabulary that I'm using. Section 601, I'm just going to read a couple of brief sections, then I'm going to go to Section 802. And this is where I'm going to send chills up and down your spine if you're not familiar with this. Section 601, the Secretary of Labor, in coordination with the Secretary of Defense, and the heads of other agencies as deemed appropriate by the Secretary of Labor shall, one, collect and maintain data necessary to maintain a continuing appraisal of the nation's workforce needs for purposes of national defense. Two, upon request by the director of the Selective Service and in coordination with the Secretary of Defense, assist the director of Selective Service in developing policies related to the induction and internment of persons for duty in the armed forces. Now, that's just a basic old draft. But what, to the untrained eye, and someone who's not versed at all in constitutional law and procedures, uh, what should catch anyone's attention who knows anything about the Constitution would be the fact that the Secretary of Labor is involved. This should be all DOD stuff. This should all be uh, Selective Service stuff. But now the Secretary of Labor is involved, and when I go to Section 802, That'll explain why. So here, let me, or excuse me, if I said 802, I meant 502, I'm going to have to cover in an 802 as well. Here we go. Um, Section 502, consultants. It says, the head of each agency, and we're talking, you know, department-level positions, like selective service, DOD, so otherwise delegated functions under this order shall employ persons of outstanding experience and ability 
without compensation. I'm going to read this again. The head of each agency, otherwise delegated functions under this order, this is Section 502, titled Consultants, and this is by delegated by the authority of the president. And they also cross-reference this in Section 710B, C, and Act 50, U.S. Code, applicable paragraph 2160B and C. So there are cross-references to this. This is not the only place this is in writing, but this is stunning. According to the president, his designees can employ persons of outstanding experience and ability without compensation and to employ experts, consultants, or organizations. The authority is delegated in this section, may not be redelegated. Uh, now, let's be real plain here. When you say without compensation, that's slave labor, gentlemen. There's no other way to interpret this. Right. This section, Section 502 of Executive Order 13603, allows the president. In fact, let me mention this, too. In peacetime and times of national emergency, in other words, you don't have to even declare martial law to invoke 13603. In peacetime and times of national emergency, that's a quote from this executive order. He can employ persons of outstanding experience and ability without compensation. You remember when Alex Jones used to talk about the civilian inmate labor brigades and all that that was coming? Oh, yeah. That's what this is. I cite whitehouse.gov. Right. I go to the original source document for all my documentation on this. Exactly. So there's no question that this is from Obama, that every word in here that I just read is from the president. There's no question what I'm talking about here. This is slave labor of American citizens. You see, they, remember, I go back to, and this, this is why I read Section uh, 601 first, because it said the Secretary of Labor in coordination with the Secretary of Defense. See, they want to have a military draft for World War III, but they also got a, get a civilian conscripted slave labor force under the Secretary of Labor. Yeah. That's why they've subdivided conscription now under two heads. Right now, selective service, you know, is basically a defense operation. It's not when Obama says it's not. That's when it becomes a slave labor operation. And that means this. They could send you, Doug, to one place to do work, and they could send your wife to another place to do work. That's right. You have no say in the matter. This is slave labor, folks. There's, I've read this at least 100 times, and I think this has been out since 2011, and there's no other way to look at this. Now, I believe that what most people say, they mean. They're going to do it. This is why I believe we're in danger from Jane Helm. They're not allocating these kind of resources, men and material, if they're not going to make this activity go live someday. Well, the same thing is true here with 13603. It, they're, they're not putting this into print because they had nothing better to do that day. Clearly, there is an intention behind these words. And the intention is you, if you survive what's coming, are going to be slave labor. You will go where they send you, and you will do what they tell you. This is even worse than what the Soviets did back in the 1950s when they would assign people to their jobs and assign them an apartment and so forth. And this is worse than that. Yes, it is. Yes. No, I, I totally agree with you. But it, it just what amazes me is the unwillingness of people to, to take a look, to take people at their word, like you just said. I mean, they, they didn't create this just because they had nothing better to do. Uh, I mean, words mean things. Orders mean things. They're um, done for, for purpose. And... <laughs> It's pretty clear to me. Uh, my goodness. Uh, okay. So, and so, yeah, I, I I'll give you an example. I'm driving down the highway. It says 55, and there's a cop sitting off in the bushes with radar. The sign means 55, and that cop is going to separate you from some of your money if he catches you going over 55. The 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 55 was written on the speed limit sign because there was intention behind it. It's no different than 13603. There is intention to turn 
many people in this country into slave labor. Amen. And, right. and they already sanction it. I mean, come on, this shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody. You've got Walmart in conjunction with Jade Helm, I mean, big DOD operation with Walmart involved with Jade Helm. And what do we know about Walmart? Well, at Walmart, and this was covered in an HBO documentary a decade ago, Walmart, when they moved their factory into an area in China, they required the workers live in a local dorm, even though they have homes in the area. And the cost of the dorm, which are horrible living conditions, but the cost of the dorm exceeds the amount that these people are paid. And if they leave, they have to pay it back. If they stay and work, they don't have to pay it back. So that's slave labor. Yeah. That's virtual slave labor. And our government lets Walmart get away with this. We talk about human rights violations and how we need to be on the side of human rights. and uh, we, uh, It's a bunch of nonsense. Walmart, Nike, kids don't go to school. They work for 10 cents a day, as young as 10 years of age. They can't leave the assembly line unless it's their schedule break. So they, they, they defecate and urinate on themselves so they can keep their job. I'm not making this stuff up, guys. It's all been in print. It's all been validated. And our government's just fine with that. And they let these people into these free trade agreements, bring these products back into the country, and undersell American manufacturers at the cost of slave labor. So if the government sanctions this with regard to foreign trade and this trade imbalance we're suffering under, then why should anyone be surprised under 13603 that they want to turn you into a slave? And that's exactly what's going to happen. Steve Quill's spoken about this many times. Uh, we, you know, we are going to be the ones that are, are going to be engaged in the slave labor. I mean, that's the intent here, of course, to take away the uh, the assault on the middle class, the removing the middle class, and any semblance of freedom that we've got. We're going to be the ones making the um, the junk for the uh, for the rest of the world. I mean, that's the intent is to enslave us. I will not go to a slave labor camp and engage in the manufacture of goods that I know are going to be used to harm people, and that's what this will be all about. Um, you know, my I will not. I'll forfeit my life before I do this. And uh, I, I think of enough of us. Again, it's just like Gandhi. You know, if, if you stop flying, they do away with the TSA. They, these people only get their power because they scare us, intimidate us, and we go along with them. We give them permission by our actions for them to do what they do to us. Very well said. Very eloquently said. You're exactly correct. And do you think, you know, I was wrestling with this. We'll bring it to uh, what we're talking about here. You know, I just I got an email the other day about SEAL Team 6, and we've interviewed uh, Mr. Strange on. We've had him on, um, um, lost his son in, in that disaster. Yeah, Charles. That take? Charles Strange, right? We've interviewed him. What's... I, I, go, going back in history, and I know you've written about this prolifically. You've looked into it. Uh, just the cover up of the the raid. Um, I mean, what was your conclusion? My conclusion is Osama bin Laden had been long dead, and uh, they might have killed an imposter. And uh, SEAL Team Six wasn't fooled, so they had to wipe out SEAL Team Six. That's a real popular theory. It's the one to me that makes the most sense. But at the end of the day, Doug, I don't really have any hard and fast proof. Yeah, and that's the trouble. I mean, we, it, it's there is some reasoned speculation there, and of course, uh, uh, some oddities. I agree with with what they said. I, I do I mean, too. Just from what we know, um, I don't believe first and foremost that Osama bin Laden was killed on uh, a raid on a Pakistani compound nor do I believe he was even alive. But even if he was alive, that definitely, in my opinion, was not him. Uh, well, and, and they have come out, and, and I, I'm not sure how many listeners know this, but they have come out and verified that that is the White House. They verified that the picture taken, though, that famous picture with Hillary with her hand over her mouth or whatever it was, or looking, everyone looking at the monitors, that was actually a, a staged picture. They verified that. And that's what people were saying from the beginning, like like Dave Hodges and and uh, Alex Jones and others. So you know, I mean, if 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 they stage that, then I mean, if if the deception's there uh, at that level, well, what does that tell you? Well, the thing that got my attention was this: 
when they didn't produce a body. And what was the cockamamie story they told? that, And in deference to Arab tradition, we dumped the body in the ocean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, are you kidding me? Well, you know, what should have happened was this, is that we kill our enemies. Let's assume 9-11 is what the government called and We all know it's not. But let's assume for the sake of argument. So you have 3,000 Americans that are killed. And we've lost the Constitution since 9-11. And so we kill the man who supposedly is responsible. The prudent thing to do as a head of state is you bring the body back, you do the forensics, you guarantee it's him, and then you return the body for burial to the family. And you say, oh, that would be impossible to do. Really? Then why is it after 9-11 that uh, President Bush had dinner with Osama bin Laden's family? That's been well documented. Sure. Exactly. So, so don't tell me that that can't be done. It can be done, and it should have been done. And the American people should have been satisfied. This is Osama bin Laden. But instead, you know, we kill an imposter, so we dump the body in the ocean, and we tell this cockamamie story that no one believes. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, no, I, I I agree. Yeah. You know, I remember uh, I was uh, – I used to broadcast at our other home in central Phoenix, and I was – there after a show and my sister-in-law had popped in and uh she got the news and god love her she turned out i'm proud to be an american playing Mm -hmm. at the top of the speaker amp volume parading around and i i turned it sound down and i said do you really think this is true and she goes it's not she knows about my show obviously and she said it's not and i said no it's not this isn't even believable. And we talked it out for 30 seconds, and she goes, yeah, I think you're right. If the average person could just sit down and think for a second, they would see through all the garbage that's out there. I mean, let's just look at the inflation rate. This, And I know this is really going out in left field. But just to show you, people are saying, hey, guys, the economy's on the rebound. Uh, inflation's only 5%. Unemployment's only 5%. Let's talk about those two figures for a second. First of all, when they figure the inflation rate, they don't count gasoline or food like you don't have to eat or drive to work. I mean, come on. You've got to be kidding me. We are a petroleum-based economy. People commute an average of 25 to 30 minutes a day, and you're not going to count the price of gas and inflation? And we've got to eat to survive. I mean, it's crazy. That right there disqualifies the inflation figure from even being seriously considered. And then you go to the unemployment figure. Uh, if you're a teacher who has a, uh, a certificate, if you're a beautician who has a hairdresser license, if you're anybody that has anything like a real estate agent has a real estate license, it's presumed that you're employed. Whether you made a nickel or not, they presume you're employed. And you go off unemployment after six months, it's presumed you have a job. How can you trust figures that are calculated in that fashion? But the average American looks at that and goes, yeah, by golly, look, the economy is on the rebound. No, it's not. The, the government is just full of crap. You can't believe a word they say. The real unemployment, the under and unemployment rate in this country, guys, is around 25%. People who aren't working full-time, a lot of that's due to Obamacare, uh, and, un, and unemployment combined, that's about 23 to 25%. The real inflation rate somewhere between about 13 to 15%. Yeah. So, they lie about everything, and, and okay, they lie. Governments lie. We know that they've lied since the dawn of time. All right, but what's sad and distressing is the average person won't give them the sense that God gave them to actually see through these lies that are so transparent. That's frustrating. Like I said, about 10% of the country, in my estimation, is awake, alert, and intelligently understanding the issues. And the other 90% to various degrees are watching Fox and CNN.